Before we start with tonight's agenda, um, I know the mayor wanted to give us a COVID update, so we'll go ahead with that. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the committee. Um, a couple of things I want to um, bring to your attention. First of all, I want to thank Superintendent and uh, those on uh, Brockton Public School side. I, I took the opportunity today and went down to uh, Middleborough where they have the uh, day camp. Uh, the YMC is having a day camp. Uh, 35 students all from the city of Brockton. And I want to just thank everybody because uh, I asked how they get there. And of course, the school buses is provided by the city of Brockton. But uh, this week, uh, Superintendent was able to actually do door to door pickup. So originally there was uh, one specific location they'd be picked up. Now it's actually to the homes. 35 great young boys and girls, and it was awesome. So I wanted to bring that. That's a good thing. A bad thing is uh, we're a red classification now, meaning that COVID is uh, alive and well here in the city of Brockton. And uh, we moved up from a yellow class to a red class, which is not good, not acceptable. So I will be, uh, as the mayor and chief executive officer, I will be generating some executive orders and work with a law department uh, today, uh, and something will be generated for tomorrow. Uh, we need to. I mean, I would say vast majority of Brocktonians, I was just talking with, uh, with Sharon on the way in, I think a vast majority understand the urgency and the severity of this, 277 loss of life. Over 4,500 people either have had it or do have it right now. And, uh, you know, we have to take uh, action, and I will take action. And one action is that I uh, had a call with uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito, and this week we did a call with Tom Turco, Secretary of Public Safety for the Commonwealth, did it in my office with Chief Gomes, and I asked bluntly if we could have additional resources on the weekends. We will have additional state police helping Brockton PD, uh, and we will be addressing the parties. Uh, the only nuance now is the governor made a change yesterday. So originally the finding process was outlined where state police, local police, or Board of Health could do the finding. Uh, the amendment revision yesterday is only a municipality's Board of Health can do finding. So we will, uh, we will figure that out. But I just wanted to share with you, I know all of you have been following on social media and the, the enterprise, but uh, this is dire. This is dire. And we just, you know, we can't lose any more people. Uh, and uh, we just have to control our own destiny. We know what we need to do. Follow the protocols outlined by the medical professionals and Dr. Herman. I will tell you, I had a conversation with Dr. Herman this morning at Zoom at 1045. Uh, and he said um, that the information they shared with us last week, you know, we were yellow last week when we took that vote, and it was a heated vote, but we definitely did the right thing. The red classification now, there's nothing higher than that. So our goal now is to get back to yellow and then ultimately get to green and then ultimately get a cure. So uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mayor, for that update. And, yeah, I agree, you know, we've heard from people that obviously have concerns about remote learning and, wanting their kids in school and, and 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 when we took the vote i said i want the same thing but this is something that we as a city are in we're, we're in control of this we practice the protocols we follow the guidance and and you know that's you know we're in control of this as a as a community so um all right so the uh, agenda for the evening i'll just run the agenda down as i normally do um, we're going to review the final opening plan uh item number two will be professional development item number three will be the virtual school for remote virtual school. Um, four, we'll talk about school, school, schoolology and other associated technology. Um, we'll have other business. And then the final item for the evening is that we will be going into uh, executive session uh, regarding collective bargaining. And before I turn the meeting over to the superintendent, um, I did just want to say, I know a lot of teachers are emailing the school committee members. We are getting your emails. But I also wanted to just so that they understand, and I'm sure everybody understands this, but we're not responding, not because we're ignoring you, not because we're not reading them, and not because we don't care, but we are in negotiations with your union, so it would be wildly inappropriate for us to be engaging with members of the union on the very issues being bargained. So we're hearing you, we're reading them, you know, your voice is being heard. I just didn't want anybody to feel like they weren't being heard because we're not, you know, really responding other than thanks, got, the, got your email. So um, anyway, so I just wanted to say that um, so that, you know, I, the teachers who have reached out understand that we hear you, but that's as much as we can really say. So I'm um, superintendent. All right. So um, we're going to go over the uh, 
uh, the highlights of uh, the reopening. This is we're not going to go through the whole plan as it was pages and pages, but um, you have you have that in your packet from last Friday when it was submitted. But um, we'll just go over the highlights from that, and then we'll talk about professional development. We'll talk about Microsoft 365 and Teams in Schoology. It's our new learning management system, and we'll also talk about our virtual school um, for those students, parents who are choosing to have. Um, their children um, be fully remote even if we are to come back to school in the hybrid model. Is this not on? All right. All right. Maybe I'm just not talking loud enough. All right. Sorry. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody knows that these are draft schedules. Um, these are schedules that also have to be bargained, which we will continue to do over the next several days. So these are just drafts. Um, but I, people, we need, everybody needs to understand that um, we are required by the Department of Education to teach a full school day. Um, and that's going to be, again, very difficult for kids being in, a, in front of a computer um, for an entire, entire day. But um, our teachers are very creative. Um, we're going to do a lot of professional development to make sure that uh, there's some break time for our students and um, they're able to get away from the computer, engage in other kind of learning instead of just sitting in front of a computer all day, but they do have to engage in a full day of um, remote learning, and we are required to follow the time on learning regulations put forth by the Department of Education. We are required to take attendance daily and during the period so we know the engagement level of our students uh, and so their parents know as well their attendance. Um, so there be expected to log in at their regular staff time, um, they'll be required again to take attendance every morning and at each period. Um, there'll be live instruction um, by video conferencing platform and pre-recorded instruction as well. Grading will be consistent with our district's existing grading uh, policy. Here's a sample schedule of K to five and this is a half day schedule. If, if this is bargained then teachers would have um, some professional development one day a week in the afternoon from 12.15 to 3. Um, again, this has to be bargained. And then there's a full day schedule. If there is a half day, that would only be one day a week. That would be a half day for teachers um, to be able to then, it would be a full day for everyone, but teachers then would be engaged in professional development for those, I think it's about two, two and a half hours at the end of the day. But students would be required to continue with learning for a full school day. And then obviously on the right is a full school day. It follows pretty much where an elementary schedule is now. So that's where we need to be very creative. And there's also something where, and again, this is something we're working on, but it's not an easy solution, is to figure out how we're going to get students fully in fully remote, how we're going to get them their breakfast and lunch. As you can see, there's some breaks built in for lunch. But again, if students have to leave their home, go to the closest school, get their lunch, it's going to be tough for them to make it back home in a half hour. So we're, we're exploring all kinds of options. Um, we, might be ha we might have to use some of our buses and vans to get lunches out to the neighborhoods. Uh, as you know, we usually serve about, about 10 to 12,000 meals a day when school's in session. During this uh, grab and go, we're, up, we're down to about 3,000 a day. So we need to get that circulation back up. Um, and again, we'll serve lunches at every school as a grab and go, but we have to figure out how to get breakfast and lunch out to the neighborhoods because um, we need to make sure that um, families are getting what they need, especially through our, our free lunch program. This is a sample schedule for grades six to eight middle school. Again, this is all subject to collective bargaining. Uh, that's a half day schedule on the left, a full day schedule on your right. Again, it pretty much follows what a schedule is throughout um, a regular middle school day. This is going to, you know, we are tweaking this all the time, working with um, Kim, the BEA, the reopening committee, Our executive team talks about it often. We're just trying to figure out how we can engage kids, um, give them some breaks, have some time in between classes so they can get up and move around and, again, not sit in front of a computer all day. And this is a sample schedule for Broughton High School, and, and the alternative schools are also working on their schedule as well. Um, it's based off of this, but it could be tweaked a bit. So again, a half-day schedule, a full-day schedule with six periods, um, so students are getting the subjects that they need. Uh, electives will be built in, obviously, on top of the major subjects. So I can answer any questions about schedules if, um, if you want me to. All 
All right, next, I think, June, I think it's you. Yep. You have a microphone? I do. <laughs> and so um, next what we're going to talk about is professional learning and something that we spent a lot of time thinking about um, as we started to plan for professional learning in this COVID era is how are we going to work with our teachers to help them to, again, deepen their knowledge? How are we going to help our leaders? What kind of work are we going to be able to do with our leaders to help them to lead in what's truly a new environment for all of us? And how is that going to lead to school improvement? Because regardless of the environment, learning environment we're in, school improvement still has to be a major area of focus for us. And finally, we're thinking a lot about how we're using, of course, how we're using technology to support our students, our teachers, and our families in this remote environment. And so most importantly, something we have to consider is what is the Brockton Public Schools curriculum? Um, so we did some thinking around how to share this information with our families and again with our teachers and with our school committee to help everybody to understand how we're going to take the resources that we already have in the Brockton Public Schools and sort of convert them into this remote learning environment. And so when you look at the elementary level, we're looking at math for, we, we use Envisions, um, we use a math workshop uh, format for math instruction, and we uh, use Discovery Education for Science, Reach for Reading is our core reading resource, and Foundations is our phonics program. And so uh, quite a few of these resources are, are not, I wouldn't say easily, but we, we were able to convert them to uh, remote, learning, remote learning materials for our students in the spring. And so those will be the resource, those are, will continue to be our core resources as we um, open schools in September. As far as middle school is concerned, we're using Carnegie Math Solutions. And again, that's, that's a resource that we presented to you at the retreat back in January or February, and we're looking to expand that resource to all of our middle schools. Amplify Science, we launched that last year, and so we're looking again to deepen teachers' expertise around using that resource um, during the remote learning and in the remote learning environment. Newzella, again, that's our social studies resource. It definitely lends itself well to a remote learning environment. And then we have two um, we have two ELA resources that we are we are piloting this year in the middle of all this, and we think that both of them lend themselves well to a remote learning environment, and that is Amplify Reading and Study Sync. At the high school, we're excited that we're launching Carnegie Mathia. Uh, it's a resource that Carnegie extended us uh, licenses for the high school during the closure, and it was well received by both our teachers and our, our students. And Nuzella is another resource that we're going to be using at the high school, and that's a 612 resource. And I talked to uh, Nicole McLaren today, the department head at Brockton High School for English, and she let me know that they would also be using Nuzella to support some of what they're doing in English at the high school. And we've heard the high school talk about um, how they're approaching their planning around 10-day cycles of instruction and that they have a clear focus on social emotional learning and teaching and creating safe and supportive environments for their students. And so as we were thinking about all of those different resources, we also have to consider uh, some of the topics that are coming out of the work that we're doing in the district redesign, in the district reopening team. And so we do have those 10 days and we have some topics that we recognize that we are going to have to spend a considerable of amount of time working with our teachers uh, and giving our teachers time to work on these initiatives. And so when you think about the 10 days that we, uh, that, the de that DESE granted us, uh, we were grateful for those days, but we could really use more. And so when you look at some of these topics, social emotional learning, we're going to talk about Microsoft 365, Schoology, and how we're using technology to effectively work with our students. What are some of the safety protocols that we need to be put in, we need to put in place? Common planning, department-based initiatives, school-based initiatives, and orientation planning. So those are all topics that are coming out of the discussions that are happening during the reopening committee planning.
And so next we're looking at our professional learning schedule. And so the reopening team has three levels that have worked really well together and they are the instructional core teams. Again, they are the reopening team committee and they actually met today and really went through these dates to provide a clear, just a clear plan for how we're going to use those 10 days effectively. And as the superintendent said, we recognize that this is all subject to bargaining, but what we work toward doing is making sure that we have a balanced approach because what you'll see at the bottom of the slide is that we have district-based, we have school-based planning that needs to happen in professional learning, we have district-based planning that has to happen, and then we have department-based, and all of those are connected back to the initiatives that you saw on the prior slide, and then back one to the curriculum initiatives that are happening in the school district. And so the superintendent mentioned that the Monday days, that would be a half day for teachers, but a full day for students, and so the other issue that we really had to be thoughtful about is thinking how we're going to use that time and really be balanced about our approach to that. And so we mapped this out through December and what we decided upon was that the first Monday would be a school-based professional learning and then the second Monday would be school-based but it would be focused on grade level or in the case of middle or high school content the third Monday, Monday would be district, and then if we didn't need it for a district-based professional learning, that we would, we would turn that over to the schools who are always looking for more time for professional learning. And then finally, that fourth Monday would be a departmental meeting. And so now we're going to jump into talking about the learning management system, and Ethan is going to lead us through this discussion. Hello everyone, uh, it's actually great to be here because this is something that I'm uh, very excited about. We have a new learning management system which has a very silly name which is hard to pronounce, Schoology. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about it. Mike told me to be very, very succinct tonight so I'm going to try hard. Um, a learning management system basically is the way that I like to describe it is it's a shell. Think of a uh, website and you put all of your content, all your course content inside of it. It's a way to organize so a kid will know exactly what they have to do. Parents can see it. So that's what a learning management system is. It is called Schoology. I want to talk a little bit about the process we use to select it. I'm actually pretty proud of the process, although it was a little frustrating at times because it didn't go as quickly as we needed it to go. But we had a very large team. We had a team of over 30 um, Brockton educators. We worked very closely with Kim and the union. In fact, we went to Kim and said, Kim, make sure that you let us know who are some people you'd like on it, nominate them. This is all volunteer. Folks spent a large amount of time in the summer volunteering their time. So we had elementary, middle, and high. We had um, Heather Ronan leading the elementary group, facilitating it. I facilitated the middle school group, and Carrie Kopp facilitated the high school group. We had um, guidance people. We had special ed. We had uh, members from the bilingual department, teachers, administrators, thir uh, parents. We had th over 30 people. Because I think I was in charge of it, it took a lot of time and we researched very carefully. So we wanted to find out what an LMS can do, what it can't do, because believe it or not, it's not gonna solve all the problems in the world, but it is a very exciting thing. The good news is we reached agreement and that's very tough for a large um, group to do. We sent out a district-wide survey and the survey was very clear, okay? Elementary folks felt they needed an LMS at the start of school. High school said, you know what? We want to adopt it later. We have a lot of course content to put into it. We already have some things built in teams. We want to go that route. Okay. Um, and middle school was kind of in the middle. But everyone was very clear they want to have a lot of training on this. So that is something that's going to happen to kick off the training, that is supposed to be a 
backbone because Microsoft, it used to be called Office 365, now it's called Microsoft 65. The first training, the training that uh, we bargained and it is uh, mandatory training for all staff, it's going to be in Microsoft 365 because you use all the products of Microsoft 365, you put that inside your learning management system. So whether it's a Word document or a PowerPoint slide or a OneNote notebook, it's all in the LMS, but those are Microsoft products. One of the things about um, this training, Mike has been really clear, it needs to be flexible, it needs to be responsive, it needs to be individualized. So if you're pretty advanced, we have something for you. If you're a novice, we have something for you. It is asynchronous, it is live, it is your choice, there's a lot of choice there. And first we're gonna be doing this training and then we have those 10 days and in those 10 days we'll be doing more training in Microsoft 365 and training in Schoology. So it's really, really exciting. We've wanted this since, you know, probably eight years ago, but our budgets just didn't allow it. So um, this should be a major upgrade in the experience. And I have to tell you, you know, with that agreement slide, everyone in the, uh, not everyone, but there was overwhelming majority of people who found Schoology to be the easiest to use for teachers, for parents, and for kids. And so that was the main thing. I was looking at the data integration, obviously my selection didn't win. I was looking at the wrong thing. So um, that's what we have. And so just building off what Ethan said, we, we will look forward to coming back um, to you within the coming weeks to do an overview of 365 and Schoology so that we'll be able to, or you'll be able to have an understanding of at least the basic features of the resource. And so, again, building off professional learning, um, you can see that we have quite a bit of it going on in the school district. And some of you who were on the school committee last year remember that we had John Safier from Research for Better Teaching come in and give you a presentation about some of the work that we were going to be partnering with Research for Better Teaching on, which was centered around high expectations teaching. And I'm happy to say that we were able to kick off that professional learning. And if you remember, it was a pretty ambitious attempt at working with the entire school district on one initiative that would be something that would be K to 12 and that we would all be able to invest in together. And so we were able, obviously, to uh, start that work um, when I think it was uh, the last professional learning that we had around high expectations high expectations teaching might have been in late February right before the March closure and so we were left with some cohorts cohorts who weren't able to complete that professional learning and so we were able to reconnect with John and research for better teaching and he's excited that we're going to be able to continue that work together and just to remind you, we had every a cohort from every single school in the school district participating in this professional learning opportunity. I um, mean, at the high school, we actually had several cohorts, and that was starting to gain some traction. And we were excited about it, but with the closure, it obviously and rightly um, went fell onto the back burner. So this isn't something that we're expecting to roll out in September. Obviously, we have other priorities. We have to get school <laughs> up and running, but. Uh, we're hoping by October, late October, early November, we'll be able to build upon the work that we started last year and that we're going to, again, continue to focus on those same cohorts. So we're not looking to, to have new people start this professional learning, but to really focus on those people who had engaged in this work last year. And I think an important reminder is that high expectations teaching is written into all of the school's turnaround or sustainable improvement plans. And equally so, we're going to continue our work on professional learning communities. It's something that we found that we've been able to gain quite a bit of traction on. And this is really an opportunity for our teachers to have a structure where we're able to build that capacity around teacher voice. And we know that it is uh, an, an effective and re it's a research-based effective 
process where we know that it leads to uh, proven student outcomes. And so we'll continue to grow PLCs across the district. And then another academy or um, initiative that we had planned out in the spring, and I'm excited that we're actually going to be launching this tomorrow at the elementary level, is we partnered with the Lynch Leadership Academy. And the Lynch Leadership Academy is a program or a, a professional learning organization where they work directly with principals and we we are able to we were able to cre create a micro academy within our own district and it's about on-site support of course it's not on site it will be remote um, but it's the focus is on increasing the su sustainability of the principalship and so for the elementary principals for this school year we have five sessions planned and again i mentioned a micro academy and it's about leading systems and structures for adult learning and instructional improvement and the p professional development topics are around effective professional development and how to lead that how to lead effective teams what adaptive leadership is and thinking about coherent and cohesive systems in your schools and so for tomorrow we have our we have our facilitator from lynch leadership academy coming to work with our elementary principals and the focus is going to be on leading effective professional development but it's going to really target leading professional development in a remote learning environment and finally, it also includes an individualized coaching piece. And so principals will get, in, in every single principal participating, and it's all of the elementary principals, will have individualized coaching with a faculty member from the Lynch Leadership Academy. And so that's something we're looking to grow. This is just where we're launching it at the elementary level, but we look forward to growing this work. And so if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Any, Mrs. Sullivan? Um, I just have one question on the, um, I think it was the K to five schedule. It said like on a certain block for specialist. I was just wondering what, um, it was on the part that the superintendent. Oh, at the beginning. Yeah, the K to five. Okay. It said I that can I can pull it back up. At certain time, there'll be a specialist. The oh, K to five. Right yeah. Yes. Yep. Does that mean that the specialist would be on then, doing something? Yeah. Okay. Music or, g g or g an art and stuff like that. Okay. Mike, you might, I don't think your microphone's Sorry, on. teachers will be teaching a full day, so obviously there's prep time for them, and um, so specialists take over for those at, during those times, and it also provides them with some movement breaks and it builds some time into the, um, you know, into the schedule that allows students to get away from the computer as well. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comment from any other members of the committee? And it's, it's important to note that there's a lot of work that teachers will be doing um, together in teams with each other because it's going to be very important for teachers and administrators uh, to support each other because as I, I said before this is remote teaching and remote learning is the toughest job they'll ever do um, it's we were all trained to teach in a classroom not to teach through a computer so uh, it's very hard work um, but we also want to make sure we're very um, flexible um, we want to make sure we build in time for social justice issues that have to be addressed with our students obviously um, so we want to make sure there's going to be training for our teachers and administrators for that and that obviously needs to be time in the day for um, students and teachers to engage um, so they're able to engage and talk about social justice issues so those are the kind of things we'll be working on when we when we work on our professional development 
Great. So, Mike, can I just add, because in the, on this professional learning schedule, again, um, the district reopening team put this together today, but something that we were very thoughtful about is ensuring that each one of these days allows for teachers to do some independent and sort of group work with their colleagues because we recognize that teachers are going to need a considerable amount of this time to get their classrooms, their virtual classrooms up and running. And that, w that we had quite a bit of conversation around that. So when you look at a day that might say district, there's not an expectation that we're taking the entire day what we we talked about is making sure that for just about every day there's a part of that day that is dedicated to allowing teachers to do some of the work that they need to do in preparation for opening their classrooms right um i was wondering if, if it's possible um maybe for our, for the next meeting to be able to, can we see like, I don't know, a, a demonstration or just uh, get, get an idea of what the end user, both teacher and student experience is gonna be like with this? Ethan, are we gonna be ready to, show, could we be ready to do, show a couple of modules? Or is there a, I mean, it doesn't have to be the we next meeting, even through, the one after? Well, we can always go through what the school, Schoology has on, you know, we can bring them up and then we can. I think it'd be helpful for, yeah, it, it obviously awesome for there's, parents watching. Yeah, obviously. That's, yeah, we'll do that. That's a wonderful yeah, idea. They yeah. obviously have advertisements and and they give you a highlights of what it shows you. We'll do definitely do that. Right. Yep. Okay. Next meeting, we could do that. Great. Like we I said, I mean, if do, you need more than a week, it's, it's oh, no, fine. No, I, before I think, school starts, we probably could use a little more than a week. Two weeks. That's fine. All right. Two weeks is fine. Yeah. Well, well yeah. maybe we can have somebody like actually show you what a whole day would look like. No, I mean, not sit yeah. here for Right, not sit here for six school hours. School but, but yeah, that's what I mean. I kind of want to see, yeah. you know, and, and you for parents see what at a home classroom you want students to see, like, what is this going to look like? What is this experience going to look like for the end users, if you will, um, instead idea. of having no idea until the first day of school? Absolutely. Yep. So, all right, that'd be great. Thank we you. We can Thank work you. on that. Ethan? That's exactly why I asked. Thank, thank you. I, that, I think that'd be great. I appreciate that. Um, yep, perfect. Any other on questions or comments on the items so far from the rest, from the members of the committee? Okay. Um, I think we're at other business. No, I can no. just go over um, the virtual full remote. Oh, right. Yep. Thank you. I want to make sure that. So a survey went out um, yesterday, Jess, this morning, this morning to our parents. Uh, and families to ask them if they choose if they're choosing to keep um, their child fully remote even if we are to come back in a hybrid model we've asked for a commitment form that would keep them uh, fully remote through the second term which is the first semester which is February 2nd it's just February 2nd um, our goal of this virtual school and it's going to take a, a little while for us to get it off the ground because we obviously have to make sure we can staff it um, we do not want to give our students to the state's Florida virtual school uh, what the state is offering as a third party. Um, I just think it's important to keep these students as part of as the Brockton Public Schools. There's a good chance that some of these parents will choose to have their child on, on in remote learning for maybe up to two years. So I think it's important for us to keep those students as part of the Brockton Public Schools. So we'll be working closely, the executive team, uh, with Kim to, to kind of get this virtual school up and running. And again, it's going to take time because it has to be staffed. So there's obviously um, a good chance that the students, even though they, the one benefit of being fully remote, uh, these students will end up obviously um, in a classroom. And, and then if we stay, if they want to stay fully remote, then we would have time then to you know, pretty much transfer over to a, you know, virtual school. But it would be, the goal is to have it be with a Brockton Public Schools teacher or teachers. So, uh, depend, again, but you have to line up 
the subjects with the kids that sign up for it, the grade levels. Um, so there's a lot to go into it. Um, so we'll be working on that and we'll continue to update you. Yeah, and, and I'm glad we're doing that. That is something I know I've heard parents raise concerns about is was it gonna be the program that the state was pushing or were would the remote or virtual school be Brockton Public Schools teachers? So I know that the folks I've heard from, parents I've heard from, would much rather what, what we're doing. And it could be a combination of ingenuity, which we yeah. do use in the system, but it would be support if, again, if we end up with subjects that we don't have a teacher to mac, match up with that subject, right. but ingenuity offers the course and a teacher, Brockton Public Schools teacher would support that. Mm -hmm. But our goal is to not, you know, not use that as a full, right. um, full part of it, but it could supplement some courses, specialized courses that are needed right. if we don't have teachers that line up with either grade levels or the subject matter. Right, we use it sparingly if we must. Yes. Right. Great, okay. Um, Mark? Yes, Mr. Minichello. Um, I'm just wondering, are we gonna have anyone sort of monitoring or reviewing those online, that online state program so that if there is in fact uh, some uh, product that is provided teaching and learning to the kids that is very effective that we are going to be able to you know um, take from that and well we're not going to use one of those we actually have our own edge annuity so we'll continue using what we know and what we can which we already have teachers trained and administrators trained to monitor and um, Dr. Cobbs used it at the end of the year for Edison Academy we use it for students who are on home teaching for medical reasons and then we expanded it for all students in grades 6 to 12 for, the, for March through the end of the year so students could go off on their own and take some subjects that they might, they wanted more time and there, there was a Spanish 4 course and a, uh, a student that was really advanced wanted to say, you know, I want to, I want to try this. So they were able to try it and then a teacher was able to monitor exactly what they were doing. So it's already, we already have it in the system and the benefit of that is what you just said, Mr. Minichello, is that we can actually monitor it and, and find out what, you know, what our kids are doing on that. We, we have a login, we find out how much time they're engaged with the teacher, um, how much time they're engaged in actually the subject matter. So that would, again, that would continue and we, we want to not use that as much as possible. We want to use our live Brockton Public Schools teachers, but if we have to supplement with some of those courses, we would, but we can monitor that closely. What is the, um, what is the drive that um, sort of the, the, the online or, or in-system library for teachers to pull from for resourcing? Is this, this is like the C drive or E drive or yeah, something? Yeah, what's the shared drive? The, what's our shared drive where they share? One drive, the one drive. It's called one drive? Yeah, but there's another one that, what's the letter that we use? The P, P, drive. The P drive, thank you. Okay. That's we've another the, one. That, we've used the H drive, the P H drive, the another S one. drive. So there's a bunch we of places teachers put shared, shared resources that there's an H drive, there's a P drive, and also now there's the one. So, so <laughs> the one drive, I guess, um, has that, have these tools or, you know, um, programs been uploaded already now for teachers to be able to pull from and they usually do a, teachers it, usually share their own materials with in within these drives correct if they have you know, effective lessons or well I think that that's part of some of the training that yep. we're going to be launching into within the next few weeks and I think even though there are teachers out there who are using the one drive effectively and Ethan would love to speak to this except I have the microphone so, but um, after the modules that have been created, and I actually went through five of them within the last day or so, they're really excellent and I think are going to better prepare and allow teachers to use that OneDrive in a really effective way where they will be able to collaborate easily with one another. And that's also a feature in Schoology. So and it's also important to note that once, that's why for those 10 days, it's really important for us to give teachers their time to do their planning and that's plan with each other, build, build lessons, work together on remote lessons. And also if we do end up with one, one day being a half day, which would be professional learning with teachers, that would be another way to, for them to expand that and be able to create shared lessons um, and, and, and use best practices. Okay, yeah, I mean, I just wanna make sure obviously that we upload into this one drive you know um the latest and greatest things we have now with regard to the you know, virtual learning and 
if, if there are, you know, if, if we can put pieces from the state's program that are effective, you know, load it up. Yeah, we can you know, use, all, you know, yep. basically it's, it, to me, it's just a library of resources for the teachers. And I mean, a lot of teachers are very nervous about teaching virtually. I've heard, I've had conversations with some that say to me, I want to be in the classroom because I really would, yep. I'd rather the kids in front of me, I enjoy teaching to, you know, kids and, um, I'm not looking forward to the virtual teaching, you know, whether I'm doing it from here, there, or anywhere, but I just, I would rather the kids in front of me. I just, I enjoy teaching that way. So, and then we, we will have some new teachers. I mean, yeah. there, there are, so, you know, teachers that are, are just coming out of school, I mean, to have those resources and Absolutely. that drive so that for these kids that have never done it before, you know, um, I think it has to be yeah, readily, readily available to them, you know. And, yeah, if we don't do it through teamwork, it's gonna be very difficult. Yeah. And, I, and, and I've heard from other superintendents in meetings that they've lost teachers who have left teaching because they do not want to teach remotely. Yeah, they they want, don't want to deal they, with the technology. Just, they, they, a lot of them to, too. they, they yeah. became teachers to teach in the classroom. Um, so yep. you know, I've heard from superintendents who have lost staff because I just, just said I, I didn't sign up for teaching this way, so I'm going to take a break. So that's happened throughout the state. And again, because it's so difficult to be to teach fully remote it's it's going to be the hardest work that we all do and especially the teachers do no question about it it's going to be interesting because some of the newer teachers are much more uh comfortable let's put it with uh, technology but yet they don't have the um they don't have the experience you know and 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 the um sort of recipe for success of effective teaching yet you know so in essence uh, they can come on board and help some of the you know, teachers who aren't so tech savvy and yet at the same time benefit from the experience, the knowledge and the uh, pure teaching skills, you know, from, from the veterans. So it, it, it could be an interesting time for collaboration of new and experienced and both benefiting each other you know, in this uh, you know, tsunami of a mess that yeah. we all have to live with here, you know. Absolutely. so. So hopefully some good will come out of some chaos, as they yeah. say, you know, so. Yeah. All right. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other yes. comment on anything else, anything we've gone to dealt with so far? Okay. Other business. Yeah. So other business, I have um, uh, athletic director Kevin Cairo is with us. Um, as the guidance came out for sports. Um, and that came out after the, this agenda was set, but obviously this is a very important topic. Um, so obviously we wanted to bring it up onto other business and I'm gonna have uh, Mr. Cairo go through a quick PowerPoint to just go over the highlights of the guidance that came out. Okay, thanks Mike. And uh, I just wanted to, by the, by the time we're done with this presentation, hopefully you'll have a better understanding of what athletics across the state's going to look like as of about one o'clock this afternoon. I know that there have been some reports that the MIAA had put out the other day. Um, little confusing. Some people think it's going to be back to normal real quick. I can tell you right now it's not. So let's just walk through um, what, what I have. All right, so these are the, principle, the guiding principles of why we feel athletics are important for our, for our students. And I don't think anybody will, will argue these points. Um, the last one being that, you know, it's supposed to be fun, but safety has to be our number one priority. Um, so that's what we're working towards. And I think that if you ask the coaches, the players, the parents, um, they all want to get back as soon as humanly possible. I mean, I know I do, but we have to be very careful how we proceed. The MIAA has... Um, come up with four separate seasons. You have three traditional. Um, you have fall, winter, and then there's this fall two, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but th this is going to be kind of a flex season if some certain safety protocols cannot be into put into place, then it will be up to schools to opt to go in this fall two model, and those are the dates that are listed in there, and they've moved quite a bit in the past few months. And I wouldn't be surprised if they move again. So that's, those are the four seasons that have been identified by the state. 
And there are certain levels of sports. You have your low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. And those, I identified those up there for you. And at the bottom, I think this is an important piece of information that was left out um, from a lot of the news that was reported yesterday, that the final recommendations from the State Athletic Association have not been determined yet. Uh, they still have to meet with the Sports Medicine Committee, the EEA, and they will be coming out with their final modifications uh, on September 1st. And there's certain things like they want to eliminate throw-ins in soccer, heading the ball, face-offs in field hockey. If you can't social distance in certain sports, then you have to put a mask on. So a lot of the things that weren't mentioned in the reports, those will be coming out um, with the final recommendations in September. And then if some schools feel that they cannot um, adhere to these protocols, that's when they will take a look at moving to that flex season. So the fall sports have the potential to move to that flex season in, in March through April. Um, as far as where we are at, as far as remote learning goes, that is the policy that, is, um, that the state has given to us. So Kevin, can you read that for us? Sure. Uh, Districts designated as yellow, green, or unshaded based on the Department of Public Health metric have, that have their students learning remotely at the start of the season, they may delay their season to that floating season that we talked about. And then under that it says if a yellow, green, or unshaded district that is only offering remote learning to its students wishes to participate in the regularly scheduled sports season, which would be that September 18th through November 20th, it must be approved by the school committee. But we're not there because, as the mayor pointed out to um, at the beginning of the meeting, we have been designated high risk. And as a result, we must postpone, this is by state guidelines, all sports seasons and practices. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, and Mike, you and I will we'll meet and, and discuss what our next steps are. And these is what I think that our realistic next steps are. I mean, like the mayor said, we need to continue to monitor the infection rate. Um, you know, we need to tell our kids and everybody in the community that they need to follow the protocols and social distancing and sanitize. Um, and one of the things that I'm excited about that just came out from the National Federation of State High School associations is that there's an online course so coaches know exactly how to deal with return to play policies and how to monitor locker rooms and how to make sure everybody's staying safe and lastly I mean I want to encourage our kids to stay active get out and jog do push-up sit-ups but I want them to be um, safe and responsible in the meantime. So um, basically, I mean, the, the state has made the decision for us. I mean, but however, um, first of all, we all know how important sports are. I mean, we know what our seniors and all our high school students lost last year in the spring, losing their spring season. I mean, this stinks. I was a coach. I played. I mean, we all want sports back. Um, we, we, as soon as the city, the numbers were down, the mayor allowed us to have captain's practices, and we've had those throughout the summer. Obviously, um, using all the guidelines, following the social distancing guidelines and masks, and we did exactly what the guidelines told us to do, and our teams have been practicing, which has been great, it, all conditioning. Um, but again, now that we're in the red, it, it pretty much tells us right now on um, today is August 20th that we have to postpone the fall season and put it to the floating season, but again, um, we as a as a body use we can continue to see if we end up back in the yellow then we can have the conversation before september 18th and decide um if we are able to have those low risk sports that are and again it, it, when we're in the red we're not even allowed to practice never mind play so i just but i think that 
I don't think we have to take a vote saying we're postponing. I just think we continue to monitor the metrics, and if we end up in the yellow, then we have the option to continue with a fall season. But again, we still have um, just about a month left to make that decision. Right. Well, and the, the MIA and the state pretty much have put the guidance out that make, yeah. takes the decision out of our hands. You know, and, and it, I, it stinks that we can't at least allow them to practice. You and I spoke earlier, and I asked that exact, well, can we at least let them practice? Right there, they say you can't even do that. So, um, you know, I mean, the, the best thing we can do as a, as a city is, again, follow the guidance and stop with the big gatherings and all the other things that we know we need to not be doing to try and get this thing under control. That's the best so, thing we can do to yeah. get kids back in schools and, and, and able to participate in all the extracurricular and sports and other activities that, that are so important to them. Absolutely. I mean, this is just, it's, the, it's horrible. It's ridiculous. It's just, right. you know, for our kids that, and I'm, 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 but I'm in, I am glad that the MIA put a floating season in because just to cancel oh, uh, yeah. a fall season and say, yeah, you know, too bad for those of you who are either high risk, especially the high risk, um, you know, was ridiculous to not put something in for those kids to be able to do something further. But again, we'll continue to watch the metric, and if some reason we end up in yellow and we stay in yellow, then we come back together and talk about the possibility of, you know, having something starting on September 18th. But that right. depends on where the metric goes. Right, and hopefully the metric goes oh. where we need it to. And thank you. You know, because um, and, and I, you're right. I'm glad they did add the floating season, and rather than just canceling it. Because if you look at the, ta the cities that are red, it's disproportionately urban yep. cities. And, you know, so that, that's, that would really hurt I, a lot of kids in urban cities. And, you know, um, I mean, as it is, it, it stinks that they have to have a delayed season, but at least there's, there's something. And hopefully the, the metrics go the right way and we can get this thing under control as a community and be able to have something this year. So, Ms. Mendez. Um, my question is, so the floating season, if it's only based on red, so are they gonna be competing upon other districts that are also in red, so? Mr. Mr. Cairo, the talk about the MIA, if this floating season, are they gonna let, um, so say some of the districts that are in the yellow or they're in the green or they're in the white, um, and they're able to have these low risk sports um, in the um, in the fall, yep. will they will they be able to participate so we can actually have a schedule in the in the no. floating season? As far as I understood it today, is that once a school decides to go forward with the, the traditional fall season, and they complete that season, they cannot opt to take that sport into the floating season. And when do they have to? Is there a decision date that you have to? Well, I mean, uh, honestly, if you stay red, the decision stays. It, it's mm -hmm. done for you. If it's yellow, if it moves to yellow, uh, you know. But we talked about that a lot that. today because we were on, I was on two Zoom calls. One's one urban ADs, majority of the schools in Boston. And then we had one in our league. And I just think once people see the modifications that the MIAA is recommending, I think a lot of schools are going to say, you know, we can't do this. We don't want to do this. We're going to move. I think the major the, from what I was hearing today, the majority of the, um, sports were taking a look to go to the fa um, that floating with the exception of cross country and golf those were the two that were um i think they will try to move forward on those because there's really no contact involved in that but all the other ones as far as soccer and field hockey and volleyball the majority of folks wanted to take a look at moving it to that floating season and again, I'm, I'm one that hopefully if we can move to yellow, then we could consider golf and cross country. I mean, I, I we can't even I'm all for, we can't consider it until we get out of the red. As long as we're in the red, it's, it, it's nothing. Yeah, I mean, it, we it, like it or not. Districts designated as red based on Department of Public Health metric of average daily cases per 100,000 residents and therefore have their high school students learning remotely at the start of the season, which would be before the fall, must po postpone their entire season, including practices, until the floating season later in the year. So until we get out of the red, yeah. we can't consider. But again, we still have a month. Right. So 
I'm, I'm all for if we can move to yellow to have the conversation again. Certainly about Before the low. September 18th. And right. Well, again, we got to get the numbers down, Mrs. get the metrics uh, down. Mrs. Sullivan. Mrs. Sullivan. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Cairo, there's been a lot of um, parents and some students writing us letters and about really about the cross country and all the sports uh, because um, I'm not sure how this works because I mean my kids didn't really do high school sports so a student is usually scouted in their senior year by colleges so it's really important the students will be missing will they still be able to get a chance to be looked at regularly like they would if the season was in session by scouts well, and how would it affect their college years yeah and I mean that uh, it's an unfortunate reality that we have to deal with and that was the case for a lot of the kids in the spring that didn't get to um, get scouted but I am hopefully optimistic that things will change and for those of those uh, especially the runners that have been contacting us we do have an indoor track season and there's a chance to run distance we have a spring season that's outdoors that is um, also distance involved. So I'm hoping that those opportunities will be given for them. And I know that they're frustrated and they want to go back, but we have to do this the right way. And when the state says you can't practice, you can't play, there's really no wiggle room. So I, that's kind of where we're at. I thought it was really amazing how some of these students have been getting together and practicing over the summer and they're ha they've had zero cases of the COVID because they've been following the oh, they've, they've followed the guidelines. I mean, we've rule. put out the hand sanitizers yep. for them to use and the facilities have, have done a great job keeping on the restrooms clean and the coaches and whoever's out there, the captains have been making sure that there's social distancing. So when you do it the right way, it works. Yep. And I, th I think that's really responsible of them to, because these are just students to take on you know, being responsible about the um, guidelines for the COVID because that's what we need the public to do if we're going to get back to any normalcy with the schools is we need the public and we're appealing to you to please, the mayor has been telling you what the guidelines are. We need to have everybody be with us on this so the kids can go back to school. Well, I mean, I know we keep saying that, Mrs. Sullivan, and I, someone told me today, apparently there are underground parties and basement parties, backyard nightclubs going on. Well, the, the wonder our numbers aren't, our, our metrics aren't good. I mean, you know, uh, you know, we got to take this seriously as a, as a community. You're right. We're appealing to the community. Help us. Help us get your kids back in school and get these programs open again. Vice Chairman, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Cairo. I mean, that was a very good summarization. What I thought was uh, really, really um, a game changer was the mandatory training for the coaches for the COVID. So kudos to you and all the coaches. I mean, that's, that's information that needs to get out to the general public, that every coach is taking that training. And so that when we do get back to yellow, and hopefully it's sooner than later, coach is going to be ready, willing, and able to hit the ground running that day. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. yeah, so what we'll do is um, Jess can um, put out a message to parents tomorrow, just basically from me and the school committee, um, and just let them know that um, as of right now, uh, we're red. And then um, at this time on, you know, August 21st tomorrow, that the fall season's postponed and uh, we can't practice. And But however, we still have a month before the season starts and the school committee will and us will continue to watch the metrics and once it gets into yellow this right. will come back together and if we can have those sports that are low risk participate in the fall season we will but right. again yeah. well, that's the metric we have to watch if you guys go on the city website the dashboard that Rick Herman Dr. Herman does every day uh, that's going to track what's red what's yellow what's green so 8.5 was the statistics so we're a hard red right now so yeah. again it's on the city website so we'll put out a clear message to, you know, to the parents who've been, yeah. you know, so they know, the students know. And again, we know how important this is to them. I mean, it's, you We've know, been, if I, I mean, lost basketball when I was in, at Brockton High for my four years, I'd be devastated. It's, so we're going to do everything we can to make sure that these kids have a season. Um, that's why we all have to work together to get us out of the red. And um, it, sports for students that participate um, 
it's the most important thing to them and obviously they're student athletes um, and it's just uh, it's just so hard for not only the, the, the families the students but the coaches who put their heart and soul into coaching any coach that coaches doesn't do it for the money they do it because they love doing it and uh, they love to coach and they work so hard especially all our coaches how hard they work with all with all our students they they just don't coach during the, the year they they pretty much work with these with these kids you know all year long right well thank you mr Cairo to appreciate your coming and uh, putting this together for us so we will keep looking at this and hopefully we can make some changes any other comment from the committee okay I, Vice Chairman, I just want to give a quick status update yeah. I was neglected to do at the beginning the cares act funding I uh, had a call last uh, Friday morning with Tom O'Brien, the treasurer of the county, Greg Hanley, one of the commissioners, myself, and Troy Clax and the CFO, um, and, and Superintendent and all have been uh, wonderful partners in this. And I, I was very blunt, where the heck's the money? Quite honestly, where's the money? We submitted it a very long time ago. So we were scheduled to be on the docket tonight to have a formal vote of the uh, committee and get a check next week. It got delayed. It's going to be Tuesday, and there was a promise representation made that we will have a check by next Thursday for the first round. So just wanted to keep everybody apprised that we haven't forgotten that, and uh, right. <laughs> they, uh, they got my uh, sentiments, believe me. Thank you, and thank you for staying on top of them with that. So, All right, any other uh, business? Uh, the last thing is a quick announcement. I want to thank Phyllis Ellis, the president of the Brockton uh, chapter of the NAACP. Uh, she sent us word today in, um, for the AXO. Um, the mayor and I uh, did a pep, pep rally for the AXO students. Uh, there were students from Brockton that go to different schools um, that competed in the national mm. AXO competition. Um, and she sent us an email this morning, me and Dr. Murray, that um, Stephan Stephanie Amaz and Krishna Brajal, um, Brisnall, won bronze medals at the National AXO competition. Um, the award center ceremony was last night. Uh, and I know that Phyllis and the team, uh, her education committee at the NAACP put a lot of time in this supporting the students that all uh, went on to this competition. And we really appreciate their support, especially of the Brockton Public School students. And we really congratulate these two and uh, we'll recognize them at an upcoming school committee meeting. Great. So we thank you. And that's all I had, Mr. D'Augustino. All right, very good. Any other business to come before the curriculum subcommittee before we? Just, just uh, we're talking about commitments and, and thank yous. I want to thank Superintendent and, and Sharon Walder and, and John Williams, who's a city employee. Um, Jackie Jones and her sister Gwen Knowles did, uh, was it four weeks, Mike? Four weeks? Four weeks, yep. Four weeks of um, teaching uh, black history, African-American studies, free of charge to the youth in Brockton. And we did a ceremony yesterday. It was at East Middle School. Uh, and I want to just publicly thank Attorney Jones, Jackie Jones, and her sister Gwendolyn Knowles. Uh, but more importantly, I want to thank the boys and girls that took the time. It was an awesome event. And thank Mr. Williams for his efforts and Sharon and Mike as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Great. Anything else? Is there a motion to thank adjourn well. the curriculum meeting? That's it. Thanks, June, Cliff, Kevin. Thank you, Jess. All right. Motion to adjourn curriculum meeting. Can't adjourn. You got to go into executive session. Oh, right. We got to do that as part of curriculum. You Thank you. Sorry. Never mind. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll wait till the room clears, and then you can get us into executive session. Members of the committee, we're going back in. I need to uh, read the statement um, again. Executive state uh, executive session statement as a reminder: when the committee goes into executive session pursuant to the purpose, which is collective bargaining strategy, the law requires that the chair declares that an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the committee's bargaining position. So prior to going into a formal executive session, I'm going to read the following into the record. Committee will enter executive session pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter, chapter 30A, Section 21A3, for the purpose of conducting strategy with respect to collective bargaining, as conducting this deliberation in an open session would have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the committee. The committee will not, keyword, will not return to open session following executive session. Thank you. We'll take a two-minute recess, and then we'll go in.